Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Physios and Friends Around the World. Today, I bring to you a special guest who is also my friend, and we know each other for many, many years. I'm going to introduce her, and then we're going to speak to her about her experience in her career. Today, we have with us Ms. Mariela Zuniga. She is an occupational therapist. And uh, let me read her uh, biography to you, and then we start our interview. So Ms. Mariela Zuniga is an occupational therapy consultant with more than 10 years of management experience in rehabilitation services. Currently, she provides occupational therapy in home-based settings in DC, and also holds, a licenses, holds licenses in Maryland, Virginia, and New York. She has expertise in home assessment and home modifications and has collaborated with the DC Office of Aging in implementing, implementing the Safe at Home program, which provides safety adaptations in and around the homes of qualifying seniors and adults with disabilities. Additionally, she conducts home accessibility and safety evaluations for private clients who opt to thrive in place. She advocates for older adults and consults with startups and tech innovation in aging and longevity space. As a consultant, she also provides and advises management groups, both here and abroad, in strategy, markets, insights, business development, and operational processes. She has served in leadership capabilities, capacities in various settings as a QA manager in early intervention program in New York, as a lead OT in schools, outpatient clinics, and as supervisor, then director of rehab services in one of the largest home health care agencies in New York City. Since relocating to the Washington metropolitan area, she led rehab teams in skilled nursing facilities and successfully turned operations to profitability improved compliance, and drove high levels of client-patient satisfaction. Mariela completed her bachelor's in occupational therapy from the University of the Philippines, Manila. She also holds a master's in business administration from the Instituto de Empresa Business School in Madrid, Spain. Mariela earned an executive certificate in home modification from the University of Southern California and is also a certified aging in place specialist through the designation program of the National Association of Home Builders. She also has completed her certification in dementia practice from the National Council of Certified Dementia Practitioners. Her volunteer work included serving as an ambassador for the Washington DC chapter of Aging 2.0 uh, she also successfully managed for four years the mentorship program of MET United States, an international nonprofit organization dedicated to helping women and entrepreneurs through mentorship, education, and technology. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Mariela Zuniga. Thank Hi, Mariela. You. Thank you, Imril. It's very nice to be here, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this um, project. It's good to see you. Thank you, Mariela, for being with us and sharing your experiences with us. Now I know your career has been uh, spanning for decades and mm -hmm. you have been wearing many hats. Yes, uh, you've yes. Been, yes uh, you've been a consultant in tech, uh, in healthcare, and you have worked as a director of rehab departments. Now, tell me, Mariela, how this journey started, when this journey started, what motivated you to choose this profession in the first place back in mm -hmm. the 90s? Yeah, so it, it kind of began when in college you use um, occupational therapy or physical therapy as like a pre-med course. Um, my, my parents um, were doctors and so it was like a path that um, would default to it. Um, but as it turned out, like OT is, is a way to be um, an individual um, career in itself. You can grow into it if you want to. And some of my cohorts in college have also successfully um, established their careers in, in their own niche. Um, it became like, as I go along with the career, 
I realized that we tend, as therapists, we tend to establish a more in-depth relationships with our clients because we spend more time with them compared to like the doctors. Um, not that I'm criticizing or anything like that, but it's more in-depth because you spend like at least like half an hour or an hour with a patient. So you get to know them um, more in, you know, more um, personally in such a way like how is their life um, at home, what's going on, they tell you. I mean, as as long as they they you have established a very good rapport, they will tell you stuff. So it's not just the physicality that you're treating, but you're also making a difference in the emotional and, and a mental um, well-being of, of, of people. Then um, shortly, I, I worked for a little bit in the Philippines in a um, pediatric clinic. But then shortly after that, I went to the U.S. and started as a school-based occupational therapist in, in, in Florida. So um, being in Florida, it was a good way of learning um, the U.S. system. It's like a benign way of learning how the ins and outs, the taxes and all that driving. And after three years in, in Florida, I, you know, I made my way to New York. And lo and behold, New York reminded me so much of Manila because of it's, it's a big city. Um, so, in 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 that in retrospect, is I started with um, working with children, and then it gradually moved into working with older adults through when I got to New York, like group homes and then home health, and then after home health, I went into management, operations management for, for home care in, in, in New York. So that, um, dipping my toes in that segment, it also opened up a lot of learning opportunities and education for myself and, and you know, applying what I've learned in, in business school and all that. So it all in all, it was a very enriching um, decades of career so far and then moving here to DC is also management but there also came a point when you know you kind of feel um, you're always solving or putting out fires and you kind of feel like um, you wanted some changes so I went back to like home care and also now consulting for for older adults in in segments of like technology aging in place um, the longevity um, sectors of, of the environment, of the ecosystem. So that's how it started for me. All right, right. I mean, you started with pediatrics. We met uh, yeah. uh, back in 2007 when both of us were working in the pediatric field. Correct. Uh, I was a pediatric Correct. physical therapist. You were a pediatric occupational therapist. And that's, right. and that's how we met. And mm -hmm. we both moved to uh a very different field. I moved to private practice with older adults and you mm -hmm. moved to home care and consulting with all, right. older adults or seniors. Yes. Now, this consulting that you've been doing, it required uh, a lot of certification and experience because mm -hmm. this is something not necessarily we learn at school because it requires a long uh, experience and practice and knowing their needs, which are very mm -hmm. individualized. And, mm -hmm. and how did you come to know all these through certifications or how how would you say that what prepared you for this that's a, that's a great question Imril. so when i came here to dc i was managing a rehab department for for a skilled nursing facility but there's you know like after working the the eight to five i was searching for something else i guess it's like it's also was like a professional journey and i joined a group of aging 2.0 which is like an ecosystem for um um technology innovation for the older adults because there is a big need for that and also in that space i met someone who is who was working with the DC Office of the Aging. And he said, why don't you try and get into that space of aging in place, which is helping older adults thrive in their homes, making sure that they're safe and they, they prevent falls so that they could optimize their, their lives at home. Because most of the 
you know, as, as we age or as we advance in years, um, we know that people thrive better at home. Um, so I looked into that. He suggested like um, contacting people. So when I was in, when I was a, um, a newbie in DC, I was also trying to find my own community, you know, like um, finding your people. So he con he connected me with someone and she was also an OT, very established in the aging in place um, segment. So she said, why don't you look into getting a certification for um, aging in place and home modification? And it's, it was something that I was really, in, you know, um, got interested into because although I worked in home care and then in nursing homes, um, people eventually want to return to their homes. So ultimately, you want them to be more independent, safe, um, and have a very robust life in the, you know, in the golden years. So I got certified in that, and it became like much more easier. What, what, um, differentiates me from like the home builders and the contractors who also gets um certification in aging in place and like i know some designers like interior designers would also get into that is because i'm an ot and i've worked in those settings like home care skilled nursing and outpatient then i have a like a more um encompassing um, background and what to consider as people age in place like you take into consideration the progression of the the condition the disease how because because of the science that's behind it and what you learn in school you learn like okay in 10 years you may be just working with a ro rollator but in 20 years you have to have like a bigger space in order to manage your your wheelchair and whatnot so i guess like that piece it makes it more special because you kind of look at the person as they progress through life because you've you've we've we've learned that um so that's how it was um and then as as i evolve in the space it was also important for me to understand because um, I'm seeing a lot of dementia patients to get another certification just so not just helping the person or the client but mm -hmm. also extending support for the caregivers because as we know it's it's very difficult um, for a caregiver to to manage and sustain a long-term care in the home so yes um with the background in in rehab and occupational therapy with experience in that it became you know you became more strategic in the, what certifications you're going to get and what niche you want to get into right i mean uh, that's a very um you know uh enlightening and uh, unique experience that you have now my father has dementia and mm -hmm. my father lives in bangladesh and uh, the diagnosis of dementia is becoming more and com more common uh, among mm -hmm. the elderly, maybe because they're living longer. Right. That could be one factor in Asia, mm -hmm. especially in Bangladesh and around Bangladesh, other countries like India and Pakistan. Now, the thing is, uh, as you mentioned earlier, for the caregivers, it becomes very difficult. It became very difficult for my sisters, for my mother to take care of him. So that now he's living in a senior assisted living facility. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Areas uh, like Philippines, Bangladesh, India, other parts of Asia and Africa, where it is hard for them to gain this certification, where do you think the therapists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, other caregivers would learn the knowledge that you have, would gain some ideas so that they can implement at home or at <laughs> nursing home or at senior living uh, facilities? Um, actually, like with the national, with the NCCDP, there is an affiliate um, organization, which is the International ICCDP, the International Council for Certified Dementia Practitioners. And, you know, like in the, in the web right now, in the internet, there is a treasure trove of possible resources. It may not be in your home country, but you could definitely reach out to other countries which has like a more established um, structure for helping um, with, with caregivers. There is the 
um, the Alzheimer's Association. Um, you could look into that also um, just to get the resources or like materials that you could read into. Um, it might be a good idea also, let's say for, for countries to have, because um, I know like in Asia, there's also the stigma of it. And it's one of the most challenging things is like people don't talk about it as much. So by talking about it, having discussions about it, and saying that it is it is a it's a condition um, that needs to be addressed, it takes the stigma away. And also, as people learn more that it is okay, it is okay to ask for help, especially for caregivers who are you know having a lot of challenges caring. It's okay. Um, then I think people will come to the table and talk about it. And then by itself, I'm hoping by, you know, by increasing the, um, the awareness, you can also forge like relationships and association in those home countries so that they could help each other and support each other. Because it is very important. It is tiring. I've, I've seen a lot of households, in fact, um, the devotion of the family to serve and be, you know, be there. But it is, it could be, there is something called as compassion fatigue. And, you know, you need that network, you need that chain of people to also help you and, and kind of help guide you with what resources are out there. So um, I would suggest like, looking into like in the internet but like to start there is the international council of certified dementia practitioners um they they do conduct um certification for for it but it is important to talk about it so that people are more aware and you get the the buy-in yeah right well thank you so much about that because i know that creating awareness as you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. that's one of the first thing that we need to do in countries but of course, not only in U.S., but outside of U.S. in third yeah. world countries, in countries where people are not even aware of the symptoms. They think that it's just aging and it's just right. not natural for people to start forgetting things and eventually mm -hmm. get, uh, you know, uh, uh, severe when it comes to their, you know, losing their memories and uh, forgetting their tasks. Um, uh, in, in New York, as I am in private practice and I'm seeing a lot of immigrants who are elderly, and we do see some early signs of dementia. Mm -hmm. And you know, they, they tend to forget a whole lot of things. They tend to even forget the history when they tell us about the disease condition, uh, their, their medications, things like that, their exercises, the things like when was the last time they had physical therapy. And mm -hmm. we tend to see these early signs and we notify it to the doctors. And again, as you mentioned, that also the family members have to uh, know, acknowledge, um, identify the symptoms, and uh, consult the specialist uh, whenever necessary, even in early stages, so that mm -hmm. they do not come to a situation where uh, they are at risk of having other, you know, uh, health or physical conditions. Let's say they can uh, they can have a fall or they can have uh, uh, other issues uh, by not taking One medications. Day, for right. example. Yes. Yeah. 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 It, it is. It is. It is very important. Um, like I said, um, talking about it, um, it kind of like opens the gates mm -hmm. for people to come and seek help. Because I know, it's, you know, for, for especially for, for Asian cultures, we tend to keep everything in behind closed doors. But the help is out there and it is okay to ask for help. Right. Yeah. And I think also the children, the adults, the adult mm -hmm. children have to tell their elderly parents that what are the what are the issues that they're facing? They have to be open about it because right. sometimes even the elderly parents, I think that by telling their children that I have poor balance, or I fell down today in the bathroom, they would think that I'm giving my children more burden because mm -hmm. I'm depending on them on my daily needs. And then this is giving them additional burden. But I think they have to be open-minded and um, 
talk about their health issues and also the children have to watch very closely what's going on with their elderly parents exactly. and there, there are other things that i see clinically as i treat them for even simple knee arthritis is, is uh what i see depression mm -hmm. yes. loneliness exactly. Yeah, loneliness, yeah. depression, anxiety, um, sleeplessness. Mm -hmm. So I see that when I list, see the list of medications that they're, 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 they're taking, I see that antidepressives, I see anti-anxiety mm -hmm. medications, sleep medications. So uh, our maclizine, our other medications, uh, and it's very sad to see you know them going through this situation. And I think, as you mentioned, that us as therapists, we spend more time compared to other right. health professionals, and we have to be compassionate towards them as they come to us, even just for simple knee arthritis or elbow pain or exactly. in hand, even though it's a orthopedic condition but again mm -hmm. provide them with that mental support and right. uh, that they that they need uh yeah. at this, this age it's, um, it's seeing the the person as a whole not just the condition of the right. physicality so like what you mentioned you see a lot of depression it is it is a very prevalent um, situation, especially with older adults, the isolation and the loneliness. It's 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 hard for them, especially like, let's say they're in their 80s. Mm -hmm. Most of their friends and cohorts have passed. Who did they reach out to? Um, but it's also one way for family members um, to check. Like, whenever an older adult has to go to the doctor, the doctor usually has to do like a false assessment um false risk assessment and ask if they have fallen in the past six to 12 months like one one thing that they could emphasize is they need to say the truth that they fell you know or they kind of like um had to when they trip or they had to like come from the floor sometimes like no i just had a like a lip i kind of like trip but i did not fall fall but anything like when you define fall it's it's like if you lower yourself on the ground or you kind of like you know lose a balance, lose a balance right. that is a this is an indication and you want to make sure that the doctor is aware or the nurse practitioner is aware because medication other conditions such as blood pressure might affect that and you don't want to do you want it to happen again because as it is, it falls is very costly, not just in this country, but of course around the world. And you mm -hmm. want to prevent that because once a person falls, the decline becomes more rapid after that. So you want to prevent it in happening in the first place. Right. And uh, Mariela, last month, a month of September, was a fall prevention month exactly. in the U.S. Yes. And so I did a couple of lectures. I did trainings in Bengali and in English mm -hmm. about fall prevention and balance improvement. So you see, it's so unbelievable that every 14 seconds, an mm -hmm. elderly person comes to emergency room in the U.S. due to fall. Right. This year alone, Three out of one, one out of three adults mm -hmm. who are 65 and up will fall. Exactly. And one out of two, meaning 50% of, of a per, people who are 80 and up will fall this year. So it's that mm -hmm. common. And so the, one of the reasons of fall is, of course, home uh, cluttering at home, the home environment. And as you mentioned earlier, that that's one of the things that you uh, you do, the home yeah. modifications. Mm -hmm. Aside from medications, we know there are other uh, physical health conditions. Their vision can also mm -hmm. affect. Uh, so these are some of the other issues that can cause fall. But again, home environment is a very big factor. And as you mentioned, mm -hmm. that home is an environment that is very important for their mobility, mm -hmm. for their functionality, for the recreation. So uh, again, can you elaborate a little more about the home modification part that you do in your mm -hmm. uh, music practice? Uh, yeah. Um, so like when we when I do the, the home assessment, um, of course I do the interview, like what, what um, diagnosis uh, do you have, like medication, I conduct some some of the tests like the tug test the tinetti um, i checked the i checked the the home itself then 
um, I see, they, I ask them to show me how they move around the house. And um, con in consideration of their age, their, you know, their talk score and their genetic, the, the false assessment test, then you kind of know um, that if they're a mild risk or a moderate to severe risk for falling. Um, so some of them um, live in a multi-level home. So, and some of them would have extreme pain, like going up and down the stairs. So. One suggestion, I mean, sometimes it's costly, is the the stair glider or the stair lift. But sometimes I'm um, just adding an extra rail on the opposite side and having two hands right. to propel you, that's helpful. Um, adding grab bars to um, like beside the, the toilet right. up to get up, right. um, going um, grab bars in the, in the shower. Um, if for example, patient had like painful joints and it's harder for them to get in and out of the tub, sometimes we can do like a tub cut. Or if if it's like, um, you know, a, um, the budget is not is not a constraint, then some of them would, would just renovate the, the bathroom into like a, a walk-in shower and because it's much easier than having the tub. And, you know, there is the issue of decluttering. Um, it's, it's a very touchy subject, especially mm -hmm. for older adults, because they like holding on to, to memories right. and the associated um, emotions with it. So you can only make suggestions, but ultimately it's their decision to declutter. But one of the things that you could mention is like, I know it's important and I know this is a process. You tell them that this is a long process. It would help you um, for your, you know, for safety that you try to review beginning now, earlier, and then just, you know, little by little, working through what you really need in the home to help you um, feel safer. Um, don't take away the value of the, the emotions attached to it because it is a process for them. So just let them know that you're not rushing it, but little by little, you might want to work through certain rooms to make room for a clear pathway so that they can get in the bathroom safely at night and not fall. So it's not, taking away that power that, oh my God, she wants to change all that. No, you just tell them that it is a process and you understand the process and you want to give them time to think about what is important to keep in the house. Right, right, yeah. yes. And uh, in, uh, especially in Asian community, I also suggest that making sure that the bathroom floor is not wet. Exactly. And yeah, and then there's enough lighting in the hallway, mm -hmm. in the bathroom, in the kitchen, in the stairway, exactly. in, the, in the lobby, so that you know you don't you don't trip and fall. And then uh, making sure that the carpets and rugs and things. Yeah, like and in the bath, the especially bath mats in the bathroom, because I know in Asian countries it gets humid. Right. But at the same time, you know, some 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 bath mats would get um, iffy after a while, so you just clean it. But yes, the lighting and making sure that it, it, there's enough ventilation so it dries out. Right. Yeah, yeah. And and make sure that the towel racks, some people say, no, but I hold on to the towel racks. The towel racks are not um, equipped to hold, right. hold like heavy, eventually it would give. So there are options that grab bars could, you know, re be replaced with the towel racks and then they just put the towel there. But but yeah, it's important, as you said, like the lighting and making sure that the carpets doesn't get in the way with the equipment that they have. Right. Mariela, we're almost at the end part of our show. So mm -hmm. before, uh, my last question would be about the occupational therapy career. Mm -hmm. um, in Asia, still, in, in some of the Asian countries, especially in South Asian countries, still there are more physical therapists compared to occupational therapists mm -hmm. to speech therapists. So they, they, they then to come to physical therapy field rather than going to other fields, which may not have much opportunity in those countries but outside of asia the opportunity is endless for occupational therapists now mm -hmm. what suggestions do you have for younger people for the youth 
would like to come to occupational therapy field? Um, OT is very dynamic because it talks about the occupation of the person. It's not just involving the use of hands, but it's the use of the entire being basically, because in order for you to do your occupation, whether you're a child or let's say, let's say start with like a baby, a child, um, a teenager, an adult or to older adult, you have to use the entirety of your system to be able to do your occupation. So um, primarily, I want to say, um, like with either PT, OT, or speech, is it's a service-oriented career. You want to, you want to have to serve. I mean, there's no way of going around. You, you, you would like to be service-oriented. It is heartfully gratifying, and you have to have patience because it doesn't happen overnight. Um, with OT. Um, you get to work in different settings and you see the, the, the wholeness of a person because it is important for them to work, like just brushing their teeth, combing their hair, um, being able to dress. Um, one of the significant um, and um, memorable experience I had, um, I had this patient so he's a he's a big time lawyer in 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 DC, but he had like a spinal um, issue and also a stroke. So he was in NRH, and then I was discharged at home, and I started working with him at home. So you see how he's moving at home, but at the same time, he had a very busy um, law career, and he still wants to get involved in that. So you work with um, what you have at that moment and improve them so he could eat with both hands because that's important for him, go to the bathroom and make sure he's able to dress and now get ready for Zoom meetings. And lastly, I was able to successfully help him get in and out of the car and now he's driving. So he wrote me this like really nice letter that it's one of the best things that happened to him is to be able to drive and kind of re reclaim a big part of his life because that's important for him. Um, so OT is a very practical um, career because you work with what's important for the person in what's going on in, in that stage in life. So I would encourage people, the, the youth to, to explore that. Um, it also takes a lot of heart and, and you know, patience and passion and to really know your, your clients and what makes them tick. And you know, it, it becomes very um, um, purposeful in, in, in the long run and heartening, yeah. It surely does. And uh, looking at your career that spans for decades and uh, in so many different areas and fields that you have and countries too that you have worked in. Well, uh, Mariella, thank you so much. It was such a wonderful experience talking to you, seeing Likewise. you. Likewise. Likewise. It's such a pleasure <laughs> to be a part of this. Thanks yeah. for the opportunity. And yes, so I'm sure that our audience would learn a whole lot about uh, the specialty, <laughs> that the specialty that you're working on and I'm sure that there's a big need and demand for that in, in many parts of the world and mm -hmm. uh, again uh, thank you and ladies and gentlemen mm -hmm. again I thank you for joining us tonight thank and you so uh, much. <laughs> we hope to see you again next time in another episode of Physios and Friends Around the World till then good night thank you